Hello, everyone, as you're getting settled down and hopefully fueled up and perhaps even fired up from the last several days. Uh, haven't we had a wonderful program here? Thank you, Vince team, uh, and all who help uh, prepare that. That's great. I'm Elizabeth Christofferson. Uh, it's my privilege to lead the Reed Allen Foundation, be part of the board of Media Impact Funders, uh, and really a privilege to be among all of you, too. You know, the program's been great, but what also I think we can all tell with the energy that we've had here is the people who are here have been really tremendous. So I hope you've all had some really strong connections uh, to today. It's my privilege, though, as we're uh, winding down our time together here with Media Impact Funders, is to introduce briefly our next speaker. And there are lots of ideas that you might have. I hope you, if you don't know Jim Brady already, uh, as you're trying to think how you're going to integrate and think about all that we've absorbed or met or our conversations that we've had, you know, really focus on what's next. Well, Jim, who's worked for some very uh, uh, important uh, legacy organizations, who has also uh, forged his own path, who continues to innovate and to sort of see beyond the corners that perhaps uh, some of us are, are thinking about, uh, he's got some, some uh, tremendous uh, things to be offering us, both as a, a seasoned journalist, as an award-winning journalist, and as a, a person who thinks about what it means to be informed and connected in this digital age uh, to, to this. But when I asked Jim what you might not see on his uh, bio, he said, do tell them that the Jets are 4-2. <laughs> Jim, you're right. Everyone gets it. Come on on. Lead us to the future. Thank you. Yes, I'm a little obsessed with that. Sorry. All right, I'm here, I'm here to moderate and not to really do much speaking, so would our, our panelists please join me up here? We're going to uh, talk a little bit about what, uh, what the panelists have taken away from the conference, and then we're going to talk a little bit about bigger picture about, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> philanthropic funding and some of the trends that we're all seeing out there. So, so let's start with a couple of, while everybody's getting settled in, why don't you, instead of introducing yourselves individually and then going back around to do the two takeaways, why don't you introduce yourself and give kind of two takeaways from the conference so far. I'm Erin Moran. I'm a CEO of Public Media Company. Public Media Company's been around for 20 plus years and we work um, we're a national nonprofit, and we work with public radio, public TV, and independent organizations, helping them strengthen and expand. And so in terms of takeaways, I think um, we had worked with WYPR and the banner, and I, it struck me when MTS was talking about taking lessons and learnings and talking to other organizations and what they're doing and how you can take that and apply it to what you're doing, I think it it not only speaks to what's happening um, within news organizations, but I also think, you know, on the foundation side, that's one of the reasons I think that this um, collaboration and this um, conference makes such a big difference because I think we don't all have to recreate each time. I think learning from one another and and leveraging that those learnings is really key and important and I, I just picked up on that through many of the conversations that took place today thanks so much um, hey everybody my name is Alicia Bell I am the director of the racial equity and journalism fund which is an intermediary fund um, we facilitate a, a donor collaborative which already includes some of you could include more of you. Um, and <laughs> with that donor collaborative, we, we meet regularly um, to, to learn and, and understand the BIPOC media ecosystem more. Um, and all of our, our donor partners kind of pull money together and we redistribute that money to black, indigenous, Latine, and Asian-led and serving organizations across the United States. Um, and you know, some of the, the takeaways that I'm, I'm holding from, from the past two days, I think one, you know, we, we often find ourselves in a role where we are advocating for, for journalism and journalism funding with issue-based funders um, or, or local funders um, and, and talking to them about why 
journalism plays a role in the work that they're trying to make real. Um, but one of the things I'm taking away from these past two days is that if we're going to fund journalism holistically in a way that's really reaching communities, especially communities that have been previously underserved, we really have to be expansive about what we mean by journalism funding. Um, and so when I hear folks talking about utilizing WhatsApp and engaging with poets and collaborating with artists um, and, and hosting dinners and community meetings, um, that means that we have to be expansive as we think about what it is that we're funding and what it means to fund the future of journalism. Um, and then the second thing I'm, I'm really taking away and holding is it's from a side conversation, so, so not everybody was privy to it, and I'm gonna let you in on it a little bit. Um, <laughs> but this other takeaway is that our, our neighbors don't talk about this work in the same way that we do. Um, and we are all rooted in places and spaces, and so thinking about how we talk about this work, how we talk about the future of this work, to our, our hairstylists, our lacticians, our baristas, our, our yoga instructors, our gym trainers, whoever, um, that is really gonna impact what the, the kind of public consciousness around this work is and what the narrative around this work is. And it's not only gonna make our work easier, um, but it's gonna make it easier for all the publishers that we work in collaboration with and all of the news organizations we work with as well. Hi, I'm Sue Cross. I um, am the director of the Institute for Nonprofit News, usually called INN. And uh, I'm here in another context with you as, at Media Impact Funders, also as an intermediary. We're one of the managing partners uh, behind Newsmatch, the end of year matching fund that funds hundreds and hundreds of news organizations across the country. It, raises about $4 million and has about a 10x payoff in the amount of revenue they're able to raise locally in their communities. Um, and it's thinking of that and kind of in that context and what I've heard from the, on the stage in the last day, it, it, what is exciting to me is I'm hearing and seeing a lot of examples of success from small news organizations that are really changing journalism profoundly, really truly reinventing it. And there are ways to fund them at scale and people are starting to look at that. Do we fund a whole collaborative? Do we fund all the ones covering this topic to broaden funding? Do we use these matching mechanisms and other campaigns? And there are ways to do that because I think as we're all looking at this landscape, we can see we literally need thousands more New startups replacing what has been lost or is going away or is being reinvented in many cases under legacy brands as well. So I think that's my takeaway is our challenge is how do we do this at scale and lift this kind of innovation? And um, in many cases, this journalism looks profoundly different than what any of us thought of journalism being 20, 30 years ago in a very good way, I would say. So I think that's what I'm taking away is how do we do this at a much greater scale in this time in our democracy? That's lovely. My name is John Funubiki, and in, in addition to those titles up there, I'm the, I'm the ghost of Christmas past, I think, on, <laughs> on this panel. Um, and so as you know, I, I used to be a funder at the Ford Foundation. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I had a, many side conversations as, as well, including one with a couple of those um, red-jacketed volunteers here. And, they, and one of them said, who, who are you people? What, what is that group meeting over there? And I said, it's a bunch of foundation types who fund journalism. And one of the guys said, that's great because we need journalism, right? And uh, he said that in his town, they, they had lost, lost their newspaper. So we should you know, congratulate ourselves. My two takeaways is one, how often in our conversations the last two days we have yoked the idea of the value of journalism with the principle of a democratic institution. And that with the cratering of journalism that we've experienced over the last decade or so, um, has come the cratering of democracy. And that so many analysts say that the United States has 
um, fallen from a democracy to an anocracy, somewhere between a, a democracy and an authoritarian, authorita authoritarian um, regime. And that's what's at stake, is our very country is at stake uh, when we lose, lose journalism. And so our work is just so much more value, valuable and needed, and we need to go deeper and deeper. It's takeaway one. Takeaway two, reflecting back on the conversation by Tracy Powell and, and numbers of others, how much we as, a, as an institution of philanthropy need to look inward at our processes, the way we make our decisions, who we uh, give our money to, give our power to, et cetera, and how we exercise that power and share that power. Um, and I think that's part and parcel in the work we need to do with democracy and journalism. And I'll round us out. I'm Chris Krusen, the executive director of Lion Publishers. Lion stands for Local Independent Online News. We're a membership association with about 450 members across the US with a couple dozen in Canada. Um, and you know, from the perspective of, of our membership, from the perspective of sort of me in this job as ED of Lion for three years and change, um, my two takeaways, the first of which is how many people I, I kind of personally have seen or know or, or serve on other boards with or in my current role, people like, you know, Maz and a documented Tracy Powell, who chairs our board, um, Elizabeth Hansen, who we've worked with in, in various capacities, see how integral they are to um, the solutions we've all talked about for the last few days has been a huge point of pride. And, and the second part is that hope that they represent, which is, I mean, it's easy to get caught up in the problems, the, the existential crises, which existed before we sort of, I think, knew en masse that we were sliding towards a, a democratic struggle, right? Um, but we can't lose that hope. We can't lose the, um, the, the potential. All of us are working towards these solutions and, and the beauty of, of convenings like this and the stage, literal stage they represent is, is how many of them are focusing on the answers to those problems and presenting some really exciting possibilities for all of us to keep exploring in all of our different uh, areas of expertise. It was just really, I really enjoyed that part of, of this gathering. I'm, I'm, certainly my own takeaways, I would echo that. I think um, having been to hundreds of journalism conferences over career, if not thousands, um, a lot of us who've been to some of those know that sometimes after a journalism conference in the aughts or 20, you'd have to go watch Sophie's Choice to cheer yourself up. It was like these incredibly depressing conferences of the business is dying and it was all about the problem and not about the solution. And there wasn't really passion in the room as much as there was depression. And I think coming to conferences like this and seeing how much people care about journalism and how it affects communities and the positivity and the optimism in a room is such an important thing for us to have in journalism. And it's Getting, I think it's gotten better in the last few years. There are fewer of those conferences where it's all woe is us and it's all over. But I mean, this was a really specific, specifically one of the most um, uplifting conferences because it was just so much passion around what everybody's doing and hope that there is an answer to this problem. I just wanted to add two other things which are not takeaways, but things I think are important uh, takeaways. I mean, there's a lot of conversation about infrastructure up here and I can just wanted to say that one of the things Knight's been really focused on in 2022 is really studying the infrastructure of journalism. What is it that is required for news organizations to operate, whether that's a content management system, CRM, payroll system, legal support. And we spent a lot of this year trying to map that out. We had a group of, in fact, Sue and Chris were there in Miami back in May when we kind of started to map out what the journalism's ecosystem looks like and what, what is available in those, for each of those pieces of the ecosystem and what might we and hopefully other funders be able to fund to plug some of the gaps that are in that ecosystem, so we hear a lot more about that, but I also heard a lot of people talking about those kind of things, what the needs that smaller publishers have that are often beyond their reach because they don't have the cash to, to go acquire a content management system or, or, or use some of these other systems. So you'll hear more about that from us. The other thing I just wanted to mention too is, I think there's been a lot of discussion among funders about this event that's happening in January out in California called Sunnylands. Um, and I just wanted to just talk about that a little bit because I think it's got this air of mis mystery about it that it, it, it probably doesn't need to have. Um, Sunnylands is a, uh, basically it's, a, it's an estate in California that, that holds summits basically and, and Sunnylands invited, um, decided it really felt like it wanted to do some kind of summit around local news in January and so 
a lot of the, the so many large journalism funders are in the early mid stages of actually discussing how this thing might go in January and what you know what funders will be at the table. The way it works basically is a, a bunch of funders will go there. I think there's room for 22 people or something like that because it's a it's a very small place. Um, and the idea is for us to get together and talk about what funders might be able to do together to help fun, you know put together some kind of larger effort around local news. And there's been a lot of work done on this roadmap, which is interviewing, probably a lot of people in this room have been interviewed by people at Sunnylands about where they see the future of local news headed. Um, and so there'll be some, some information out about that roadmap in the next couple of weeks. But it's an event being run by Sunnylands at a lot that, that night and a few other foundations are on the host committee of. But it really is not meant to be this mysterious thing if anybody's heard about it. I don't know what's gonna come of it. I don't, I don't you know, the idea that there's going to be some huge breakthrough at that that's gonna lead to some Massive amount of money in the ecosystem would be a wonderful thing if it happens, but there's no guarantee that that will happen. But um, if anybody has questions about about Sunnylands, happy to talk after this, but also happy to just you know respond via email if anybody just wants to send me something. But I've heard a lot of buzz in the corners about it, and just thought it was kind of good that we just mentioned that it is a thing that exists and is not meant to be mysterious or uh, in any way. So any questions about that? Uh, Happy to answer later. And also on questions, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask them at any time. If you have a question, raise your hand. And if somebody could just let me know if there's a question out there, we can jump in any time. So with that, I wanna just kind of do a, a lightning round here of questions for each of you. So I'm gonna start with Aaron. So, so public media is, you know, people always talk about public media as this thing over here that's like not newspapers and it's, it's like its own thing, its own little ecosystem that is very exclusive, but that's changing a lot, isn't it? And, Yes, I would definitely say that it's changing, and, and Elizabeth had made some references to this yesterday and also with MTS, but um, from our perspective, public media company, we work with, I think we've worked with over 375 public media organizations, and I would say within the last five years or so, there's definitely been a transition. Obviously, the Chicago public media, uh, WBEZ, acquired Chicago Sun-Times. We had worked on that transaction with them to help them evaluate whether that was a viable option for them to pursue and what that would mean for Chicago and the surrounding area. As had been discussed yesterday, we worked with WYPR to help them with their joint operating agreement with the banner, the new, um, you know, well-funded digital operation that was going on. We're, we're assisting Elizabeth and National Trust for Local News on the transaction in Dallas where they're looking at uh, acquiring Denton. Um, we have a couple of other confidential projects that I can't talk about, but that are also papers that are being looked at who are looking for homes, and they've reached out to their local public broadcaster to see if there's a fit and if, if they, again, they can um, find a new home so that the papers that are serving those communities can continue, and I think, um, Previously, there have been a number of acquisitions of digital news sites, including the Denver Right, that is now part of the Colorado Public Radio um, ecosystem. And Billy Penn, of course, here in Philadelphia. Billy Penn here Don't in Philadelphia. The, the various, um, various ists that went to public media organizations. And so I think that um, public media organizations are similarly to what newspapers have been trying to do in terms of how do they move from maybe daily print to digital? Public media organizations are looking at how do they become multimedia platformed organizations that serve their communities in a variety of different ways. There's always the journalism and local news piece, but as we saw yesterday, WRTI was here and you know they're a local music station and music stations certainly play an important part in the culture of any community between classical, jazz, um, blues, and all of that, we just see public media um, just interacting in new and different ways, trying to help uh, fill the ecosystem, expand it, and also strengthen it and in service to their communities. And so I think that um, being invited from Vince to attend the conference I think was important because I think, again, um, public media organizations raise $2 billion themselves every year, and about 50% of that comes from members of their community. That's not from foundations, that's from individuals. They are well supported. There are some that have a lot, 
and there are, as we've, we've talked about, there's the rural communities that maybe cannot support themselves. CPB gives those organizations more money, but at the same time, it's like, how do we collaborate across digital news sites and other ways to serve those news deserts? And I think public media is interested and willing and to step in and fill the void. So Alicia, on, I, think, I don't think there's been much doubt over the certainly past 20, 25 years that and philanthropy has been less represented, has been less philanthropic funds have gone to communities of color than should have. You, how much are you seeing that changing? Obviously there's, a, there's plenty of room to go, but do you see that there's been improvement in that space or do you think we're still, we're still not where, we're still struggling? And, uh, you know, as I was thinking about this, this kind of question and, and what the past and future has been, um, it made me just think about this space. And so I actually wanna, I wanna ask a question of folks in the room um, that if you are a black, indigenous, Latina, or Asian person, if you could raise your hand. If you, I want everybody to look around at this room, at the folks who have their hands up. So raise your hands high so folks can see who these folks are. If you've been working in this field for, hold on, keep your hands up. Don't put them down yet. Uh, <laughs> if you've been working in this field for over a year, um, keep your hand up. If you've been in here less than a year, put your hand down. If you've been working in this field for uh, two years of less, so journalism philanthropy, put your hand down. If you've been working in the journalism philanthropy world for three years or less, put your hands down. Four years or less, five years or less, <laughs> six years or less. So we have, we have three, four hands up. There are only four people in this room that are black, indigenous, Latina, or Asian people who have been working in the journalism philanthropy field um, for longer than five or six years. There are so many more people who had their hand up originally, right? That means that there are so many more folks who are in this space that are, there are our, our folks who are in this room, there are our colleagues, there are the folks who work at organizations that aren't represented and aren't present at this conference. Um, but it does mean that change is happening. And also, what we know is that oftentimes, for folks of color, um, we have a lot of folks who are our program officers. We have a lot of folks who are program associates. We have a lot of folks who may, maybe, maybe they are, um, get to be directors. Very rarely are they organization executives, are they presidents, are they CEOs. Very rarely of the folks in the space who raise their hand, of the folk, their colleagues, of the other folks of color, are they the folks on our boards? Are they the folks that have the final decision-making power? So it, it means that things have happened, right? We've been kind of moseying along a pathway and there's a lot of clarity as to what else needs to happen. Um, and one of the ways we see that manifest in our work is we, you know, we work with about 40 organizations that are um, led by folks of color, led by black, indigenous, Latina, Asian folks, and are serving black, indigenous, Latina, and Asian communities. And what we know about those organizations is that for, for several of them, their, the uptick in funding that they've received has happened in the past three years. Um, and, and before that was non-existent. And there were a lot of questions around whether folks were viable organizations, whether they, whether they were the right people to do the work. And we still hear that, right? We still have organizations that we partner with, news organizations that we work with, um, that go into meetings with foundation partners. Some of the folks who are our partners who are on our, and are, are folks that we see at conferences, folks that we talk to, folks that we go to dinner with. Um, and then they get asked, they, they are told that their work is really wonderful, and then they're asked if they are the right people to lead it. Um, and we have folks who, who are told that they're, they're, folks aren't quite ready to take a chance on them. Um, and so that means that there's, there's a lot of room to go. Um, and if it weren't for, you know, one of the things I'm really lucky for is that there's also been some, some ability, you know, like journalists go to different newsrooms, people go to different places. Um, but what that's meant is that for folks who have gone from white-led organizations where they had the same funders 
as the black or Latine or Asian or indigenous-led organization that they moved to, they were able to see the funding differences. And it's really disparaging and it's really disheartening when folks witness that um, because it'll be the same funding, the same funder. Um, the organization that they go to, the leaders are being called upon to be trainers at Google News Initiative. They're being called on to be panelists. They're being keynote speakers. They're winning ONA awards. Um, and yet and still, the organization that they move to receives significantly less funding than the organization that they came from. And so what that means is that we can't just have um, newsrooms that are led by and serving folks of color that are represented in our portfolios. They have to be equitably represented at least, and, and probably to repair the harm that's already happened, need to be disproportionately funded more so than other organizations. Um, and I, you know, I, won't, I won't ask folks to raise their hands, but I would ask folks to consider whether they are disproportionately funding organizations led by and serving people of color. Whether there is an equal number, at least. Whether it is representative of your community, at least. Um, and whether it is disproportionately folks of color, right? Because what we know is that when we fund organizations that are led by people of color, because every single other identity intersects, right? So we have, we have black, indigenous, Latina, Asian folks who are also disabled, who are also queer, who are also women, who are, are also rural, who are also in the mountains of the Appalachias, right? So when we're trying to reach those places and trying to get to those intersections, we're gonna get to the most underserved intersections by by starting with thinking about how we're disproportionately funding folks of color. Um, and that's a thing I've, I've, I've really appreciated seeing, you know, the folks have included ask around diversity audits. Folks have asked, made ask around demographic data um, and their, their grant agreements and all of that. And that's been really lovely. And what I don't want to see is, is a place where organizations who have been disproportionately funded historically are just adding that into their mission and values and process. And there's not actually a shift happening with who's being resourced and who's being amplified and who's being platformed. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got a little further away, but we got a long way to go. Yeah. And, and I think the good news though, is that we can make these changes. Mm -hmm. Like it's not impossible. Right. We can make these changes, and by the time the media impact funders happens next year, we can be having a different story. If the political will of the people in this space and the folks that we're colleagues with and the folks that we're friends with want to make it so. So, so you have a nonprofit in the name of the organization, so are you a, an avid advocate that nonprofit is our only way forward? I'm, uh, I'm an advocate, but not that it's the only way forward, and I'm, I'm glad you asked about that. I'm, I'm going to take a, a note from Alicia's, though, and say in general, whether it's nonprofit or for-profit, the one thing I'd say to this audience is take a chance. Small startup news organizations are wildly inventive, and they are reinventing journalism, and they're quite successful. They have very high success rates, even if they're quite small, and even if they look and are doing journalism in much different ways. So don't be afraid to experiment. We are so early in this reinvention of journalism that there's going to be another 10, 20 years of wild experimentation. And um, I really, I know that's, it's hard. It's hard for us too. Do we invest in that? It may not work, probably won't work. Do we do it? Do we not? And um, I think we all have to, to take chances to come to something new. In the nonprofit or for-profit, I heard a lot of that in the conversations. Well, should it be limited? Should it not? And um, we very clearly invest in nonprofits because we find them in most markets and for most types of good journalism, the most stable and successful model right now and as far as we can see in the future. But it's not an us versus them. It's not the only way forward. We have, last year, we had about 300 nonprofit news organizations in membership. They provide reporting to more than 7,000 others. Those are almost all for-profits. 
So it's, it's, it really is an ecosystem shaping. The thing I might suggest to break through that, do we, don't we, what should we do, what should we not do, is just step up into the values I heard reflected in a lot of people's comments. What do you really want to prevent and what do you really want to do that's going to um, benefit the community? And so in most cases, you might want to make sure the money that you're giving to a news outlet stays in that community or in the news in that community. And that's a question with some for-profits, but maybe not all for-profits. So that might be a core value you can look at. It's not extractive, it'll stay in the community. Does it have local editorial control? Not all national groups do, but local family owned or locally controlled ones might. So that might be another thing you could say, that's a good telling point. And are they transparent about their funding? Um, and there are ways that for-profits can be transparent about how much they spend on editorial and how much they keep in the community. So there are ways to bridge that, and I would just encourage, rather than getting stuck in what should we do or not do, try to step back and say, what do we want to do for the community? And I think that can guide you through some some guardrails. Yeah, I mean, we, I think we feel pretty strongly that that both are, will be part of the ecosystem going forward as well, and that while while we can't don't fund non for profits directly through things like Report for America or the Sustainable Publishing Systems grant or um, funding Lion. You know, hundreds of for-profits get benefits from those grants as well, and I think that we're very happy with that. So John, you've, you were here you know, at the beginning of this, right? I mean, they're right at the 20 year, right at the beginning of the founding of the organization, is that right? Right. And so you've been at the funding game for a long time, but instead of asking you to tell war stories, what are all of, what are the, what are the accumulation of all those learnings have you see, seeing in the future? Oh, well, f first of all, as I said at the start of this uh, s uh, conference, it's just amazing how much the, the, the funding community has grown for journalism. And speaking to Allison's uh, comments about all the work that needs to be done in the, on the issues of BIPOC communities, still a lot of work to be done. But I'm still amazed that how much has been accomplished. I, I, I'm kind of an optimist. I think this is the most exciting time in journalism that we've had in dec well, gosh, dec centuries, centuries, <laughs> right? Because we are reinventing journalism. We went through the period of through the period of post journalism where everything was uh, torn up, and now we're reinventing, and we should be open to all kinds of possibilities in the future. So in, in, that, in that vein, and in this new role as the penniless philanthropist in this room, um, in one of the breakout sessions, um, uh, Josh Stearns kind of commented, God, look at all the, the learnings and the experience and the capacity in this room. Look at all, all the things that we've learned, all the new pieces of infrastructure that have been created that you know, support nonprofit and public, public media. Um, that are inventing or trying to invent business models, that are figuring out what to do with the digital technologies. We've learned a lot over the last 20 years, um, collectively. Um, and I think it was shortly after that, or before, before that, Barbara Robb, formerly of the Ford Foundation, um, said, I mean, she also was kind of blown over by that, that idea, and that she said, why don't we do a conference and we just, we just look at what works so that we all know what is working and what we could be funding. Um, so that all kind of points to the possibilities of how do we develop synergy? How do we leverage off of each other's strengths and what we're doing? How do we identify what's missing and what we need to reinvent or invent? Um, or what new partners we need to bring in uh, or, or need to learn how to work with, such as when Steve Waldman was talking about the efforts at the state and federal levels in terms of policy. You know, how do we get involved in that? Um, uh, and then this morning, I get a lot out of these side conversations. Uh, so walking to the venue here and that crisp air hit me, um, and I ran into, um, uh, Lizzie Hazelton, is she here? 
we had, yeah, we had this conversation about, you know, how great the conference is, and then we got into the, uh, the crisis in democracy, and then we kind of got down again, and uh, we worried about the future, and, uh, and, and then she mentioned, she said, have you read Octavia Butler, right? Um, and I said, I have. Um, um, and if you haven't, uh, I recommend Parable of the, uh, of the um, Parable of the, help me. Sower. Sower, yeah, Sower, Parable of the Sower, where uh, Octavia Butler kind of takes the current crises that she saw at this time, she's, she's passed now, but, um, and then projected them into the future and, and created this really uh, dystopian West Coast uh, environment in which there are wildfires going on all the time, the, 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 the uh, gap between the rich and the poor has really been stretched out. Um, people are just struggling to stay alive. Water has been privatized. Poor people can't afford fresh water. Uh, the affluent, of course, are living in their little uh, enclaves. Uh, workers are working uh, for factories and living in factory housing uh, in, in order to scrape by, and there's just violence and uh, political um, um, uh, crisis all over the place, including religious, uh, religious um, uh, backed violence. Um, and Octavia Butler was an Afrofuturist. And Afrofuturists have this remarkable, remarkable ability to think about, to reimagine their narratives, and to reimagine the future. And so what I wanted to throw out is the possibility that we could do that same thing. If we could harness our forces together and think about where this country is headed, including all of these horrible things that we've been hearing about the last couple of days, right? Um, but also alternative visions of democracy and alternative visions of the future of journalism and how do we get there and how do we each fit in? How, does it, how do different foundations and funders, uh, government policies, et cetera, fit together? And we can see what the future might look like if we put our hearts and minds into it. Uh, rather than just constantly, as journalists do, react to what's going on. So let's be proactive in forming a new future for this country. That's my advice. Mm. All right. So uh, you, meant, uh, you, know, you mentioned, um, we've talked a lot about sustainability. And uh, John, you mentioned Bob Barber's idea about having a What Works conference. You're having a conference next week in Austin that's all about sustainability. And, Obviously, a big portion of that conference is what works, because what's the point of doing a panel about what doesn't work? We know. We've tried them all, right? So do you feel like sustainability is still being discussed enough at the, in the philanthropic level? Is it enough of a focus of philanthropy? I mean, I heard it a lot over the last two days here in a way I didn't expect to, honestly. Um, and it says something, I think, about the industry that we're built. I mean, speaking specifically now about pure play digital organizations um, that started with zero and are going to one, as opposed to the sort of transitional businesses. It says something about that um, sort of emerging market that literally the question is live or die, right? Sustainability is not a real high bar. If you look at it in medical terms is can the patient live? Yeah. Obviously we should be striving higher, but it says something, right, that we still have to define zero to one um, because on one we need to build the rest. Like Sue's point, there need to be thousands more of these things. I mean, really specifically, if you look at Penny Abernathy's News Desert Research, right, the uh, primary method for the creation of most of the news that then propagates out into other media, about 7,500 community newspapers in the bottom part of that pyramid, about 150 Metro Dailies, and then the three nationals, right? The nationals are fine. Everything from there down to some level of not, right? And so they're about the research that Lion helped do uh, with, um, University of North Carolina and the Google News Initiative and Doug Smith, uh, 750 digital only. So 750 versus 7,700. Literally, just to replace the sort of single point of failure system that we have now, we have to 10x the existing you know, infrastructure, right? To do that, we have to know, will it live or will it die? And that's the question of sustainability. So we at Lion have tried to um, define that sustainability. We like 
produce, I think, literally the only image if you search journalism sustainability, you get the one that we created with the three sort of like overlapping circles of journalistic impact, operational resilience, and financial health. We think it's all three of those things combined, right? Too far in one direction and the stool topples over. And that those are, the other sort of cool Venn diagram is we're doing this event with two other organizations, the Rev Lab at the Texas Tribune, itself one of the sort of oldest and strongest pure play nonprofit local news outlets, and uh, the News Revenue Hub, which literally exists to help fund journalism. That's their website, fundjournalism.org, right? So we're doing these tracks of programming around each of those pillars and inviting, you know, I think we'll have uh, close to 500 people there next week in Austin just talking about the, the business side of journalism. I don't think the journalism is sick. It's the business that's sick, right? It's not a journalism problem, it's a business problem. Largely, it's a small business problem because a lot of these are um, newsrooms of five or fewer, whole companies of five or fewer doing the bulk of this lifting. When you don't have the overhead, you can sort of do that. But turning a URL on is not the same as having a business. And about a year in for some of these folks, when the, the sort of adrenaline wears off, the first line of funding wears off, the 401k runs dry, the buyout runs out, for those of them who are motivated to do that, then reality sets in of, they turn into business people real quick. Um, and, and that's the sort of uh, the, the use of definitions around these things so people sort of know. Because all those, by the way, hundreds of things launched and they didn't know the answer to the question, is it sustainable? They just knew there was a hole in their community and they filled it with the publication. So we see the work we're trying to do as providing that roadmap, helping them figure out how to define existence so that we can begin to define success and then begin to share success and then make those uh, efforts more sustainable overall and over time. Yeah. Uh, any questions? So I want to make sure we get to them if there are any. So maybe hand up if you have one. I, if anybody can, I can't even see if hands are up, to be honest. I'm blind up here for the most part. Nothing? Oh. Jim. I'll try to we, make this easy. I think we have a mic for you. I wanted. Uh, I'm, I'm Jim Friedlich with Lenfest Institute. I just wanted to make the, the case and get any feedback the panel might have, not only about profit versus nonprofit, but the notion that great American newspapers like the Philadelphia Inquirer or the Minneapolis Star Tribune or the Boston Globe can really live, can really thrive under the right ownership, under the right structure. And that's an innovation that I think has been undersold and underpromoted and maybe even underinvested in. Okay. I, I, I can start with on that one, just as I do think you know the, everyone that you noted, and I would add the Salt Lake Tribune and making the shift from for-profit to non-profit, pretty much every one of those is independently owned. And Absolutely. That's and I think that's the key. I think it's, when it comes to the non-profit versus for-profit funding question, I mean, I think it's very hard to justify in phil philanthropy to give to a hedge fund owned newspaper because you just always are a bit worried that whatever amount of money you give is going to get taken out of their overall budget because that's just money, that's not going to really be additive, it's just going to be replacing something else. So, but I do think you've mentioned a few that because they're independent, they have the ability to, <coughs> excuse me, to do some things and make some innovations that they couldn't do if they were inside a chain. Um, so, I mean, I do think that that is an innovation. I don't, I don't know that that's going to Personally, I don't know if that's going to be, that'd probably be the exception more than the rule unless there's a real change in the ownership structures of these large chains. But, but I do agree with you that they've done a really good job making the shift because they were able to define what their strategy was going to be and just do it, as opposed to getting it approved in some other faraway city somewhere. But other thoughts on that? You know, one thing I, w I would add to that, I think, um, is that when we consider these kind of these great American newspapers that are our legacy newspapers and organizations across the United States, what we know is that um, if not all, at least 90% of them have, have caused great harm to black communities, indigenous communities, Latina communities, and Asian communities. Um, and when we consider sustainability and leadership and kind of ethical leadership, that that existence and thriving into the future, especially as we consider shifting demographics of cities and of the country, and especially as we consider kind of the consciousness raising around harm that's happening and people understanding systems better. Um, 
I don't know that those organizations will be sustainable unless they move through a process of repairing the harm that they've created. Um, and I've, I've spent a few, a, a few years kind of really digging into what that full repair means. And one of the, the best, I would say, kind of um, descriptions, definitions, diagrams of that repair is that it requires kind of acknowledging harm, studying it to understand it, being accountable for it, and then creating some sort of redress or restitution for it and making it so it doesn't happen in the future. Um, and from several of those great, those organizations, you know, we've seen the acknowledgement piece and we've seen the studying piece. Um, and it's been really lovely in these past few years to see these, these pieces come out around kind of how we've messed up in the past, how we've not covered things well. Um, but what we have failed to see is the, the accountability for what we're gonna do now and then the restitution and the redress. Um, and so if we don't have that full repair, I don't know, regardless of the shape, the size, the IRS status of the organization, if it'll be sustainable into the future. So I, if it's okay, Jim, um, I fully acknowledge what you said and appreciate what you said, appreciate you and, 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 and that need for repair. Part of what excites me about the quote, Great American Newspaper, which might be an overstatement, um, is some of the progress that has been made, like the Minneapolis Star Tribune partnering with Sahan Journal and Mukhtar saying that part of his impact, and he views that, he said, as a kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, relationship that expands his audience and expands their, their market penetration um, meaningfully. The, the Boston Globe's partnership or, or kind of investment in, uh, in the emancipator is, a, is another example. Uh, there, have been, there have been encouraging examples, there have been, there have been failed examples. Uh, the Los Angeles Times is owned by uh, a South African, born and bred, ethnic Chinese, Patrick Sunchiang, who's deeply committed to that news organization serving a more diverse Los Angeles, and what's exciting is that they have the resources, the intention, the independence, uh, and um, and the wherewithal to uh, to serve at scale. So I I don't mean to be an apologist for either the past or for this business model, which is a very challenged business model, but only to add to the conversation that to to reach scale and to um, solve this very very big problem. Uh, I think this is this is a part of the puzzle. I think it's a, a early days for all of us, though, including, I mean, Sue's answer was that it's very early, and, and, and I don't think it's going to be uh, clearly an easy transition from one to the next, right? It's not like newspapers stop and new infrastructure starts. We're in this middle messy period where people are trying a lot of things. There are large experiments like the ones, Jim, that you mentioned, all of which I'm rooting for, all of which are in early stages, I think. Um, and I'm glad those are not my problems to solve, honestly. It's also important to remember what problem we're trying to solve. We talked about this in our prep meeting of, I think there's this fallacy that the, like the newspaper specifically, that that was a good business for its entire history. It wasn't. It was a good business for about 35 years because of a lot of societal factors. And in the early 1900s, all the way through 1970, it was a pretty mediocre business. Papers kind of went in and out of business all the time. And there's a difference between good business, being a good business and being good right. journals, exactly. right? And, and so being connected it goes to your to, community. It goes to what is our definition? What's our vision? What are we trying to In fact, to I might even make the argument that the, when the business was at its best, in some ways the journalism was at its worst. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. It only in the sense that we wrote what we wanted. I'm not saying we, I mean, I was in newspapers for a while, but newspapers kind of wrote what they wanted to write, and they didn't ask the community what they wanted because they didn't have to. The money was coming from advertising and the need to connect with the community. Or right. classifies. And yeah. the need to connect with the community wasn't really as prime as it is now, you can't survive in the future unless you build a bond with the, and you build a bond with the relation with the community. And I don't think we did in that period. So that was kind of the oddity of the business being so good. Is I don't know that the rest of it was as good. And there's a lot of journalism. There were a lot of stories being written, but they were generated by the newsrooms, not in. in not I, I'd say that kind of ownership model has the potential for being great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not the promise. Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, and one of the things that I really appreciate about. Um, you know, that messiness you're talking about, that chaos, it's 
part of the reason I tell folks that I kind of love working in journalism right now. Heck yeah. Because it's like a chaotic yes. space, and I kind of love yeah. that. Uh, um, but one of the things I appreciate, Don't you Jim, have to love it to work in it? I mean, I guess, you know, it's us. true, it's true. I do. 30 years. I, you have to have something that wakes you up every day, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but one of the things I appreciate about those, those partnerships that, Jim, you've mentioned earlier, too, is that um, just yesterday I was talking to, to someone here about uh, some of Naomi Klein's writing. And one of the things that she writes about when she, I mean, she writes about a lot of things, but she writes about climate disaster and climate change. And one of the things she, she wrote is that um, one of the core narratives at the foundation of, of climate disaster is this narrative um, that, that in order to survive and thrive, we have to be dominant. Um, and that we, and that that goes up against so many kind of ancestral knowings around being in relation with each other, being kin, being good kin. Um, and so when I, I hear that kind of partnership model and, you know, there's, there's like the, I don't know, it's the, it's the season, it's the time of collaboration all the time. Um, and so with the collaborations, with the partnerships, um, with, the, with the community engagement, with the community relation, so much of that is around how do we reimagine not having to have a dominant organization yep. or not having to have that sort, sense of dominance around narrative, around community, around partners, um, and how do we exist in relationship with each other and in kinship with each other in a way that is, that is healing and caring, right? Um, because for the folks that we're in relation with, the folks that we're kin to, we have to treat them caring, right? We have to engage in conflict that is generative um, if we want to sustain those relationships. Yeah. We have to be able to grapple with each other. Um, and, and that is something that makes me really hopeful about, about those kinds of coming togethers. Yeah, I was just going to say, Jim, in terms of the, I think the, the new ownership structure actually opens the door and allows for these types of collaboration and partnerships where in the past, I don't think that, that would have been on the forefront. It would have been, oh no, that's not good for business. And I think that the new structures allow us to have new partnerships yeah. that move forward. And I think that's the piece that it, it's catalytic in and of itself because it's allowing for new structures to take place going forward. And I think that's important. And I would also say the other theme that I feel like I heard, and we all heard at this, and we probably all heard at it, is the power of collaboration, whether those collaborations between newsrooms, but also collaborations between funders. Um, of just working together, because I mean, I've had this stock line for years that said journalism is, at a, is in the huddling for warmth phase, which is we're either going to work together to help each other out of this, or, or if, if you want to go wander off on your own because you think you have the answer, good luck. But we really should be working with each other across the board to help resolve these problems because they're immense, but they, I think most of us think they can be solved if we work together and, and we engage with the communities that we're involved in, whether it's from the philanthropic side of things or the, or the journalism side. So. Hopefully, it's ending on a po we're ending on a positive, hopeful note. There's a lot, to, lot to work through. We're at the, we're at zero here, so I think Vince is we're going to get kicked off if I keep going. So, <laughs> um, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>